Welcome to the Ministerial Leadership Conference. Let's take a look at some of our upcoming events. Hey parents, please be advised. There will be no children's church or nursery for any of the services during the conference. Build your faith with dynamic teaching resources from Bishop Butler. Order conference messages on CD, DVD, MP3, ebooks, and paperbacks at estore.wordoffaith.cc. You're good ground, and you need everyone to know. Order your I'm Good Ground t-shirt today, and we'll ship it to you. Log on to estore.wordoffaith.cc or give us a call at 888-909-9673. Save the date. You're invited to join Bishop Keith and Pastor Deborah Butler and Word of Faith International Christian Center for an unforgettable, life-changing journey to Israel in the footsteps of Jesus. March 4th through the 14th, 2024. Walk with us as the Bible comes alive before your very eyes. You'll never be the same. For more information, email us at holyland at wafik.com. Pistis is a two-year comprehensive ministerial training program that is offered online with live Saturday on-site classes. For more information, email us at info at pistis.cc or call us at 248-353-3476, extension 346. Make sure you save the date for the 2023 Word of Faith Convention. Join us in Southfield, Michigan, August 9th through the 11th with our speakers, Reverend Paul Brady, Apostle Michael Freeman, Reverend Kenneth Copeland, and our host, Bishop Keith Butler. Thanks for watching. For more information on these events and other events, please visit our events page at wordoffaith.cc slash events. And to stay up to date on all conference news, be sure to visit faithleaders.com. All right, well, good evening, everybody. So good to see you all out. Just wave at me real big if this is your first time in Phoenix. Your first time in Phoenix. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. We're so glad to have you here for the 2003 Leadership Conference. Uh, I have the esteemed privilege of being able to announce our speaker for tonight. Uh, you know, listen, I, I, there are three groups that followed Jesus around. There were, his, there were the disciples, there were the multitudes, and it was, it was the Pharisees. Uh, one group was not there to learn at all, not there to receive. One group wanted band-aids for what was going on. And then another group wanted not only the teaching, but also wanted Jesus to break down what was taught when they got alone time with him. And so many of us that are in this room and that are watching online right now have benefited from the teaching that has gone forth across uh, pulpits, uh, it, whether it's at Word of Faith or whether uh, Bishop was visiting uh, your uh, a church that you attend or whether he was flying, whether it was in the, the continental United States or it was another part of the world. So many of us have been impacted and our lives have been changed because of the revelation, the wisdom that God has deposited on the inside of our heart. And he's not just a local bishop. He's not just a national bishop. He's an international bishop. <laughs> and uh, I always talk about how I gave my life to Christ when I was 18 years old in 1995 at Word of Faith. Didn't grow up in church. Uh, had never been exposed uh, to the teaching that I was getting when I came, and my life was absolutely just revolutionized. And I can't say enough how grateful I am uh, to Bishop and Pastor Deborah just for the time that they've invested, the word that they've deposited in us, the times that they've challenged us, challenged us individually, even when we didn't want to be challenged. And uh, I'm in a confident expectation that God has a particular purpose and reason for gathering us here in Phoenix can't wait to hear from the visionary tonight on how all that is going to unfold. So if you do me a favor, if you'll stand to your feet tonight, and let's give a big warm uh, leadership conference welcome to Bishop Keith A. Butler. Praise God, it's so good to see you all. Amen. 
we are going to have a great time this weekend. Amen. God has been so good to us. And I don't know about any of you, but I am glad to be here. Not just here in Phoenix, but I'm glad to still be alive. You know, a lot of us have, we have challenges and we feel like, you know, I don't know if I should be alive today. I don't know if I am good enough to do what the Lord told me to do. But listen, this is an exciting time. And the only way it's going to remain exciting is if you get your butt in order and do what God told you to do. Stop letting others dictate to you. Let God dictate to you what he wants you to do. If he asks you to do it, he's giving you the ability to do it. Amen. So let's get started. God bless you. Come on, give the First Lady a big round of applause. Amen. Well, in May, her and I will have been married 48 years. Amen. She still makes my liver quiver. Add some glad to my stride and some pep to my step. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We welcome you, of course, to the 2023 Ministerial Leadership Conference. People are still making their way here. So, amen. Well, we're glad to see I've run into some of you from outside the continental of the United States already, from, uh, from Africa, from Europe, praise God, from the Caribbean, praise the Lord. Welcome to Phoenix. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. When Word of Faith was 19 years of age, the Lord sent me out here to Phoenix to establish a work here. And so we've purchased these facilities here, praise God, uh, and opened a church here. And I used to uh, come here every Sunday night. This church was built at night. I used to do two, two services in Detroit, fly to Atlanta, do the Atlanta church, fly here with our aircraft out here every Sunday night for 8 o'clock service Sunday night, every Sunday. Place was packed like it is now. Every Sunday night, praise God, and established a church. I loved it out here in Phoenix. I was, I was sad when the Lord said I had to turn it over to one of my younger ones. Amen. <laughs> I love Arizona. I love Phoenix. Uh, amen. But we're glad to be back in Phoenix. Of course, I come here every year. So, amen. I want to say to all our sons and daughters in the gospel, we love you and appreciate the work you do for the kingdom of God, and especially here to the pastor we sat here 19 years ago, and that is Pastor Moore and Erica. Praise God. Amen. So I tell people around the country, I tell them, I said, that this church I in Phoenix is my hip young church. 20 years old, 30, <laughs> amen. They like it loud in this church, <laughs> amen. So we're glad to, glad to be here. Now, uh, because we're so far away, this is the first time we brought the MLC to Arizona. And the reason why is because it's so far from most of our operation is in the South, Middle America, and in the East. We have a church in San Francisco, but aside from that one, this is the furthest most in the continental United States. Now, we have stuff outside the U.S., but in the continental United States, this is the f almost as far as we go. So it's a long way to get here, so uh, we haven't held here before long, and so many of you have never been to the headquarters church of this church, not been to the National Convention, which I would encourage you to come to this year. Make the trip. To, amen. You need to come to the 110-acre site over a quarter of a million square feet of buildings, beautiful grounds, praise God, and 5,000 seat auditorium. You need to come on out there. Yeah, hallelujah. But since you haven't been here, and so since Mohammed wouldn't come to the mountain, the mountain has come to Mohammed. <laughs> so we brought it to you instead. <laughs> hallelujah. So we're glad to see you out here in Jesus' name. One last time, praise God. 
Uh, amen. Lift your hand to the Father and thank him for the privilege and opportunity to be here tonight. We're so glad, Father. We give you the praise and glory in the authority of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now lift your Bible in the air, please. This is Wednesday night, so we know people are going to people uh, have some other things to do, so we're going to get right into the word tonight. Friday night will be a little bit longer. But say this along with me. This is my Bible. The Bible is God speaking to me. The Bible is the truth. And it teaches me what to believe. Instructs me how to think. And how to speak. And how to live. And how to have victory. And in it is the path to eternal life. Hallelujah. And Father, again, we thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and light unto our path. We can't live without it. It's the bread in which we chew on each and every day. Man shall not live by bread alone, you said, but by every word that proceeds out your mouth. We're grateful for the great instructor, the spirit of grace himself, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher, the comforter, the instructor. And so we ask you again to open our understanding. Teach us, instruct us, challenge us, guide us into the path you would have us to go. And Father, for whatever is ministered tonight, we give you and you alone all the glory, honor, and praise. For this we ask in that holy, mighty, matchless, and highest authority of all, Jesus of Nazareth, and by his precious blood, everyone who is in agreement with this prayer said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Open your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 21. Please, hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Remind me, tell them how to get the next tape. So as I was seeking the Lord about what would he have, have me do for the opening of this conference, and the Lord gave me this subject to minister to you, more of God. Everyone say that with me, more, more. Of, God. of God. Let's read 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring of them to me that I may know it. Joab answered the Lord, make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, I think that all my Lord's servants, why then does not my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause or of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. All they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. Judah was four hundred three score and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote his.
He didn't need anything more for the next battle except more of God, not more men. The deception of David, or you, was and is now turning to the flesh when you arrive where you are by the Spirit. And you need to understand, even with less, God will make it work out. Can I get three hallelujahs this morning? <laughs> or should I say this evening? Turn to Luke chapter 4, please. Now, Satan attempted this same trick on the Lord Jesus. There's no better example to watch than Jesus, how he responded to Satan when Satan came at him. Now, notice verse 1 of chapter 4 of Luke. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And, of course, that Greek word for full, New Testament translated from the Greek, the Greek word for full is pleres. It means he was covered over. So Jesus being covered over with the Spirit, or Holy Spirit, we know now Spirit of grace. Amen. He was full of the Holy Ghost, returned and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. It was afterward a hunger, the Scripture said. And the devil said unto him. Now let's watch how Satan comes at Jesus, son of God. And we'll see that he came out, came against David the same way. He came against Eve the same way. He comes against you the same way. Amen. Paul wrote that we should not be ignorant of his devices because Satan has no new plays. He's still running the same game generation after generation. And at some point, we ought to wise up to it, hallelujah, and not fall for his tricks. Well, notice the first thing we, hear, we see here. And the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it might be made bread. Number one, praise God. J Satan attempted to get Jesus to provide for himself since he was there at this location because the Spirit led him there. Uh, amen? And if the Spirit of God leads you to a location, particularly talking to ministers, but if the Spirit of God leads you to a particular location, praise the Lord, it's up to God to provide for you. Amen. Not for you to provide for yourself. Amen. amen. Well, when we pick up here, praise the Lord, in verse 5, in fact, we'll just keep on reading here. Verse 2, we'll read verse 4. Jesus is going to answer him saying, It is written, Thou, uh, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, this Greek word here, word, is the word rhema. Praise God. In other words, there is a spoken word of God for every situation and circumstance where God sends you. If God sends you to a place, if God gives you an assignment, there is a word from the Lord that's available to you. That word from the Lord has enough power in it, praise the Lord, to produce what is necessary in order for you to win. In order for you, praise God, to have what's necessary. In order for you to prevail, praise God, and have the victory. Hallelujah. And the devil, taking him up unto a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Praise the Lord. And the devil said unto him, All this supernatural power will I give you and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will, I give it. And it is a temptation of Jesus, meaning what? That Satan really did have this authority. He got it from, from Adam. Adam was God of this world. But when Adam kneeled down to Satan and, and listened to what Satan had to say in sin, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 became true, which reads, In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them that believe not. He called Satan the God, small case G, of this world. And so he says to Jesus, I will deliver this unto you, because it's delivered unto me. Whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. 
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, Jesus said in the parable of the sower, which if you do not know this parable, I don't know why you don't. <laughs> Jesus said in Mark 4, 13, if you don't know this parable, how then will you know all parables? Amen. The parable is about the word of God and how Satan attacks the word of God. And you said he used affliction, persecution, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, not riches, being deceived by them, and lust of other things entering in, chokes the word, crowds it out, makes it unfruitful and non-productive. Well, here Satan is, Satan is running number four. Amen. Deceitfulness of riches. If you will bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all this if you would do it. Amen. Well, when we read verse 9, and he brought him to Jerusalem because Jesus didn't buy that either. And set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Now notice Satan uses the word if. See, Satan always attempts to try and get you to prove who you are. He tries to get Jesus to question his identity. Amen. Well, Jesus responded to this in John chapter 13, actually, in another place. Turn to St. John chapter 13. And let's read verse 3 and give me three more praise the Lord, somebody. And we see here, praise God, in, in chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and knowing that he was come from God and knowing that he went to God. Jesus knew who he was, what he was doing, where he was going to wind up. He didn't think it was necessary to prove, prove anything to himself or prove to anybody else. Amen. Jesus, or Satan tries to get Jesus to question his identity. And Satan will try and get you to question your identity. Do you know who you are and what God has called you to do and where? Hallelujah. I know what I'm called to do. I know where I'm supposed to be. I wanted to stay here in Phoenix. <laughs> Hallelujah. I loved it so much. Hallelujah. But I know where I'm supposed to be. I know what my calling is. Glory to God. Amen. I want you to understand, you never, ever do anything to prove yourself for the eyes of others or even for yourself of who you are. Now, David, when Satan came against him with those thoughts, did not answer those fleshly thoughts like Jesus did. You know, if nothing else, he could have rehearsed the past victories that he had. But he didn't. See, Satan has a way of just speaking to you and deceiving you very softly. You see, God had made each one of David's soldiers a hundred times more effective. Wasn't the size of the dog in the fight. It was the size of the fight in the dog. Or let's put it another way. It was the size of the anointing on the dog. Amen. We read in our text that God made each soldier a hundred times more effective. So when Satan then tempts David, David then forgets about the anointing that is on him and his army and begins to look at how I can handle it through the arms of flesh. So you need to watch out being deceived by scripture like Satan. Two, because what did Satan do? Satan is going to then quote scripture to Jesus. Let's go back there to Luke chapter 4. Satan's going to put on a ministerial collar. <laughs> Hallelujah. And try and preach to Jesus what Jesus should do. He said, praise God. 
it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, you have to watch out of being deceived by uh, Satan because Satan will even use Scripture as he did with Jesus. He can deceive you with Scripture, and he can deceive you with prayer. He can do both. Are you listening to me? Satan can misuse Scripture, as he did here, and attempt to speak to you even when you pray and deceive you. So here's rule number one. If you're not writing anything... This you want to write. <laughs> Rule number one. Whatever you think God said. First look at all. Everybody say all. all. What does everything mean? All mean what? Everything. everything. How much is left after all? Nothing. Look at all of the scriptures on that subject first. Before you accept that it's God talking to you. Let me give you some examples of that. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Thank you, Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll take a look at very familiar verse 14 through 18. Praise the Lord. Get over here a second. It says this, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what hath fellowship, koinonia, partnership, have righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion have light with darkness? What concord of Christ with Belial or Satan? What part of he that believeth with an unbeliever or an infidel? What agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them, walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Wherefore, come out, come out, come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Well, you know, people tell me all the time God told them to do stuff. But God did not tell us to commune with or get into agreement with or to mimic the unbeliever in order to win them. Not what he said. In fact, in Romans, the 11th chapter, turn over there. Uh, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Romans, the 11th chapter, and let's read verse 13. Thank you, Jesus. And it reads as follows. Romans 11:13 13 says, for I speak to you Gentiles as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my own office. For yet by any means I may provoke by emulation, praise God, them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Amen. Amen. Now, emulation, that word emulation means with rivalry. It's a little dark up here, you know. How you preach up here with, other, <laughs> with so little light up here? I got good eyes, and I'm up here doing this. <laughs> Amen. Well, praise God. Well, he said that he might provoke them. Now, see, that, that word provoke doesn't mean that I should mimic them. The word provoke means something different. It means, praise the Lord, I shall provoke them to jealousy. Amen. 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 Not by being like them, Amen. but being different than them. Amen. There's supposed to be a differenti differentiation between a born-again believer and a sinner. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. You ought to be able to tell the difference between the two. In St. John chapter 12, let's go over there. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. In St. John chapter 12, let's take a look at verse 32. Amen. I'm about to get my flashlight out here. Uh, 
I was wondering, you preach like this every Sunday, boy. I got great vision. You must have like, you know, 18, 16 vision or something. So. All right, thank you for doing that for me. All right. St. John chapter 12, let's take a look at verse 32 over here. Oh, now nah, I see it. <laughs> what did he tell us to do to the wind people? Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will I draw all men unto me? You know, I used to be a campus minister, college campus minister. I opened up a, a campus ministry along with a, a guy by the name of Joe Friesel, who became a pastor later. And we opened up a campus, campus ministry called USC, United Students for Christ, on the campuses of University of Michigan, Michigan State, Oakland University, praise God, there in Michigan. That ministry went on for 20 years. It ministered to thousands and thousands of college students. We didn't dress no certain way. We didn't do anything different except we preached Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus delivers. That's all we did. We didn't do nothing special. Thousands and thousands and thousands of kids got saved. Are you listening to me? Indeed, in Romans chapter 12, now I'm telling you what the Bible said. Amen. Praise the Lord. See, whenever you talk about God told you to do something, you need to check it against a book. Amen. Well, what did he say in Romans chapter 12? He said in verse 2, be not conformed. The word conformed means modeled. Don't model yourself to this world or age. Amen. But be transformed or changed. By the renewing, which means the renovation of your mind. There is a, the world has an old way of thinking. We have a new way of thinking. Our mind has been renewed. Amen. If you do that, then you may prove, which means you will allow what is that good or beneficial, acceptable or well-pleasing, perfect or complete choice of God. You allow what God really wants to do when your mind's been renewed, and you are not like the world. It's just the opposite. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Well, that's one example of just things like that I've been talking about. I turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Let me talk about another area. Hallelujah. Of course, I'm the pastor of many pastors. And so I train, have trained many pastors, including this one here. Praise God. Many pastors, and I'm the pastor of pastors. So I talk to lots of pastors all the time. Amen. Senior pastors, all types of evangelists, I got, got them all. So I ministered to lots of them. Amen. So I deal with them with all of the kind of things that they deal with. Now, let me take the financial area, for example. I deal with lots of pastors who deal with this. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Not just pastors, even field ministers. It says in verse 7, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, remember that, what he said. Everybody say that with me. The borrower, the borrower is, servant is servant to the lender. To the lender. Amen. Amen. So that means if you have a mortgage, then you have to operate to some extent the way the, bar, the lender told you. You have a mortgage on a church, the bank can come in and tell you how to run the church. They will try. They will come in and tell you how to run it. They will question it if you ever have any in the red one year. Uh, amen. They can pull it whenever they decide to. I had to bail out three churches because the bank, the churches paid on time the mortgage. But the banks then decided they didn't want to have churches in their portfolios anymore, so they just pulled the loans. I had to bail them out. Hello, somebody. I know what I'm talking about. I've been, I've been born again this year 50 years. I've been in the ministry this year, 49 years. I've been a pastor 44 years. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I planted churches across America, Africa, praise God, the Caribbean, and of course, Europe. Been there, done that. Hallelujah. Now, keep reading here. 
Turn to Romans chapter 13. Now, it always gets quiet at a ministerial conference when I come down this road. <laughs> but this is not Keith Butler talking. I'm reading from the book. Amen. This is God talking. Amen. 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 And this goes not just for ministers. It goes for everybody. Amen. Romans chapter 13, note what he said. He said in verse 8, he said, Owe no man anything but love. Amen. Don't be beholding to anybody except be holding them to love. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. And then remember what Jesus told the children of Israel. When you turn to Deuteronomy 28, praise God. Genesis, Exodus, Vickers, number, Deuteronomy, praise God. Deuteronomy 28. Amen. Let's read verse 12 over there. Of course, we all know about Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and curses of the law. And if you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, all these blessings shall come upon you. And you'll be blessed in the city and field and basket and store and body and all the things that he said. But one of the other things that the Lord said about that in Deuteronomy 28 in verse 12, the Lord shall open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Now, we've seen Old Testament. We've seen New Testament. This is the blessing of the law in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word for borrow and lend is the same one. It's lava. It means that, that when you lend or borrow, you intertwine. It says to unite. It says you cleave. We would use our vernacular differently today. We would say that when you borrow, you hook up. <laughs> like a man and a woman hook up together. Oh, I thought this was the young church. <laughs> right? He's saying the same, it's the same thing. He's saying that you have entered into an agreement that is that close. And he said that they shall not borrow so that they would not be intertwined with and be under someone that's ungodly. But he said, but you will lend so that they can be hooked up and intertwined with you and become like you. Because their job was to get the people to find out there's only one true and living God. There's only one real way, praise God. They are the chosen people and learn from them. Glory to God. Now, God may have instructed you to acquire something. But don't lie on God about saying God told you to do it by borrowing, especially from unbelievers. He wants you to use his methods, not intertwining yourself and being under some other authority. How do we do that? First of all, by getting more of him. Now, there was a, a, another part to the word of God if he said it to you. And that is, God always provides. Hallelujah. If there's a word of the Lord, he provides. And how does he provide? Only with his method. He will never tell you not to do something that he himself said is not wise. That's why I said, don't lie on God and say, God told you to do that. He didn't tell you to do that. No, he did. The book said, no, he did. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God has never created a financial mess. We do that. Look at your neighbor and say, we do that. Amen. Praise God. Now, let me give you my personal testimony on this. Me and Pastor Deborah. You know, uh, when I started in the ministry and then God brought me into what we would like to call Word of Faith, and of course, uh, even our churches today are, are named these names. They're called Word of Faith. Here they're called Faith Christian Center. They're called Faith for Life. Or they're called Pistis Church. They're one of four. Okay, amen. 
Before I got into the word of faith, I knew nothing but debt. Amen. When I first started in ministry and began with our church, we used debt. We used debt because my spiritual father used debt. So he used debt. It was all right with me, he used debt. I thought it was all right. Even though in his case, I will tell you about him, he, he used it very sparingly. He'd use it, and then within 24 months, he would have paid it. But they would have believed God and paid it all off. Amen. And the scripture doesn't say that it is a sin if you use it. It just say, tells you what happened if you do. Okay, amen. And it's clearly telling you that it is not a wise thing. Well, so I, can, I go back far enough that in the 80s, there was a raging debate across the ministerial circles in America, raging debate about the subject. It was a split down the middle over the subject. Okay, and there were big fights about this back in the early 80s. Well, amen. And people lined up on one side, and people lined up on the other side, you know, and it was a big, big fight about it. Well, amen. And I decided to study the word for myself about the matter. So when I started studying the word, really studying the word about the matter myself, I began to see what the word said about it to us personally. Now, we had debt, we had house payment, car payment, all the other stuff come along. You know, furniture payment, all the stuff. We had all that stuff. And when, when the Lord spoke that to me about, yeah, there it is right there in the word. What you going to do about it? Now, the instruction the Lord gave me to open this meeting was, was to challenge you to start thinking about moving up to a higher level. How many of you want to move up to a higher level than you are right now? Moving up to a higher level sometimes takes a little bit of pain, a little discomfort. Come on, somebody. Amen. It does. So we had to make a decision about it. We made a decision about it. Once we made that decision about it, first God, praise God, we found certain things out. We found that with no debt, we found out that even if our salary did not increase, we still had more money. We found out there was, since we didn't have to pay interest on the house anymore, we didn't have to pay interest on the cars anymore, we didn't have to pay interest on the furniture anymore, we didn't have to pay interest on credit cards anymore, guess what it did? It put money in our pocket. And we found out that we were in a position to really help other people. So we have been debt free for years now. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. Well, then eventually I came, came to that conclusion that what was good for me was good for my church. Yeah. Hallelujah. hallelujah. And so then we began to point to church. Now, of course, me and her was a rowboat, was a rowboat, so to speak. The church was a battleship, understand? <laughs> okay. So, so, so turning the battleship, so you can turn the rowboat with just a couple of, Turning a battleship, man, you're going to go miles before you can even make the turn, right? But then, see, we made the commitment, especially someone who has an apostolic ministry like I do, which means it's not just the church I have in Southfield, but the church, churches across America and churches overseas continuing to do the work and all of that. I mean, if I was just a singular church with one church, we'd have some money. Trust me. We don't spend tens of millions helping other people we get no benefit from. Yeah. Tens of millions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not bragging, I'm just speaking facts. Amen. Okay. Amen. So we began to turn that thing that way and start attacking that debt. Praise the Lord. And we found out, praise the Lord, that what happened for us personally also happened for the ministry. Now, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. While you're turning, I'm going to tell you something that the Lord said to me about that. Amen. He asked me a question. You ever had God ever ask you a question? He asked me a question. And the question he asked me was, he said, where does the interest go that you pay on the debts? I went, huh? Hey, you said it again. Where 
does the interest go that you would pay in the bank? Where does it go? My first thought was to the bank. Yeah, but what do banks do? Well, banks take your money, pay you a tiny little bit of interest, if any, take it and invest it into some other entity that makes far more money, supposedly, hallelujah. In other words, they speculate with your money. You've seen a lot of that in the news lately out there at SBB Bank in California and over there in New York, uh, amen. And sometimes they speculate wisely, sometimes they speculate not wisely. Come on, somebody. Amen. amen, but they do. And when they speculate, let me tell you what some of the speculations that they do and some of the places where your funds go. They go to purchase, not just government bonds and government securities, I don't want to get into the weeds and all that, but they will also go and uh, invest in the companies who operate in places like China. Where China is jailing, torturing, killing Christians just for having church. China, they said, that if you don't worship Xi Jinping, the leader of China, if you worship anybody other than him, you are an enemy of the state, and something should happen to you. So, your money is going to kill other Christians. You sure you said God told you to do that? And the Lord asked me that question. I did some digging. When I started doing some digging, I went, holy smokes. Come on, somebody. Oh, we don't got quiet in this Presbyterian church in here right now. <laughs> Elbow your neighbor and say, you better listen up. <laughs> Amen. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, let's read verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, Paul said to the church of Thessalonica. Brethren, as it is meet because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Won't you look at that? Your faith, he said, your pistis, name of our Bible school, your trust, your confidence, your belief, your reliance, and your assurance grows exponentially. What happens to most Christians who are taught about faith is that they learn enough about it, just enough for them to be able to succeed for themselves. And their faith plateaus at some place. Instead of it growing exceedingly, it plateaus. They come to the place where they are satiated, satisfied, comfortable. I know y'all weren't going to like this message. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Amen. Instead of constantly growing. And I got to tell you what's been happening with me is that I've been growing and growing and learning and growing and growing. Amen. And with the growth has come challenge. After challenge, and let me tell you, if it don't challenge you, you probably a plateau. I keep finding out God won't let me just plateau. He just keep more. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, he passed this church on the back because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every one of you all toward each other also aboundeth. Obviously, Galatians 5, 6 says, faith worketh in energy is the word we derive the word energy from. Faith gets energy from love. In other words, the reason why you do everything is first basis ought to be love of someone else and not about you, especially not to prove something. Amen. Not to be seen of somebody. Not for a reputation. 
Amen? Amen. Not for anything about yourself. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So in the past, maybe you accomplished what God said. And maybe you used debt to do it. But if, even if you did, it was more costly and more troublesome. You see, there is the mercy of God as you grow up. But eventually, you ought to grow up. Huh? I know uh, I'm on the board of a number of entities, and I have been on the board of other entities. Uh, I used to be on the board of a hospital. I've been on the board of a university. In fact, the, both the hospital and the university I'm thinking of, the people who built it, developed it, all of that, did all the work for it, no longer have it in their possession. They lost it, both of them. They both lost it because of debt. Somebody else has got it. I do not believe that's the will of God for that to happen. I was on the board and saw it with my own eyes. I didn't tell me what somebody told me. I was on the board. I saw the finances every year. I was in the board meetings. Amen. I tried to counsel them. At some place, you have to draw the line and you have to change what you are doing or something's going to happen. And it did. In both cases, they're both out. Somebody else has to work at their labor. Amen. God is saying unto you, come up higher. How many want to go higher with God? He said, come up higher. Turn to James chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. James chapter 4 verse 6 says this. But God giveth more grace. See that word more? He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith God resists pride. But he gives grace to humility. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will run from you. Draw close to God. He will draw close to you, but cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, and notice what he said, ye double-minded, people of two minds. I'm one way with God concerning this, and I'm with the world too. You can't be two-minded. James chapter 1 said a man of two minds is unstable. Somewhere... You have to decide to make a stand. If God said it, I believe it. That settles it. Praise God. Hallelujah. More on that in a minute. You must trust more of God than more of the bank. I found that I was more free to obey God. I grew up. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you what has happened to my ministry when I did that. He has sustained us supernaturally. Immediately called me. And they said, we got a bunch of free money for you, and we know about your church, and da 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 You got, I got 120-something employees. You got such and such and such and such and such and such, and you can get a couple million dollars maybe. Now, let me tell you, I remember that Satan provoked David. I refused to be provoked. I said no. First blank couldn't believe it. I said no. I <laughs> then the second bank called me, gave me the same spiel, whole nine yards, all that, and I said no. Huh? Ain't no what to say. No. One of them newspapers on the front page above the fold listed Every church in the metro area that took pandemic money. So the sinners got to read their tax dollars were taken by the church, especially the ones preaching, my God supplies all your needs. And some of the biggest churches in America were on that list. But you know who wasn't on that list? Yeah. 
If I can't get it with my faith, I ain't going to get it. That's what we preach, isn't it? How about living what you preach? Woo! You know, our membership is smaller than it was years ago. It's greater now than it was then. Our giving to other ministries is larger now than we were given when we were three times larger. Hallelujah. Now, I'm using this example. I've been using one. I used the example about how people come at how, how they're going to use some fleshly method in order to do God's work. Second, when I use finances, because I deal with people who deal with it all the time, Scripture said money answereth all things. So you can't get away from money. Everybody wants some more. Let me see your hand. You want some more money? Let me see your hand. <laughs> Look around. Can you put your hand back up? Look around. Keep your hand up. Look around. Look around. I don't see anybody's hand down. You greedy sinners, you all you want some more money. You're going to hell you want some more money. It's entwined with everything, right? It's entwined with everything. One way or the other. That's why I start talking about an answer for all things. Money is involved, what he's talking about. Money is involved in everything one way or the other. There's some tied to it one way or the other, right? Amen. Now, let's talk about, since I'm talking about finances, how do I get out of messes? Amen. I don't mean call a bishop to get out of the mess. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people have done that. I've helped some of them. I have. And, and I Number one, first, you must be willing to acknowledge that this was created by God, uh, by you, rather, and not by God. I'm tired of hearing people tell me the Lord told them to do something, and then the mess followed. I'm tired of hearing preachers tell me that. I'm really tired of hearing congregation tell you that. But at least the congregation, they ain't preachers. They don't know better. We are pros. We are professionals. This is what we do for a living. Huh? This is what we do. So we are pros. We are as much a pro as a basketball player is a pro or anybody else is a pro. That's what I've been doing for almost 50 years. I'm a pro, right? Then you're going to have to come to the understanding that you must be willing to acknowledge when you missed it and ask God for his forgiveness. That goes with So many people are tied to you. Yeah, what? I've been listening to what you preach. And trust me, if he got off, he'd hear from me. But I'm a daddy whether he wanted to see me or not. I'm a daddy, period. I was there. That's your mama. I'm pregnant. I said, you what? She said, I'm pregnant. She said, don't look at me. You were there. <laughs> but they ceased me. I already got in trouble. First got saved. First went in the ministry. I was in a denominational church. We used to wear these white collars, these black suits, and went white collars of the general board of the introductions and all of that. See, my wife was Jezebel. She'd be absolute Jezebel. Absolute. I mean, she got on me. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. So he was absolutely all of that. First thing he said, he, said, he stood up, he said, I'm 77 years old, and I can say whatever I damn well please. <laughs> I couldn't believe. It. All of us was. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Now, he was cussing in the pulpit, all right? So number one, you must acknowledge that this was created by you and not God and ask his forgiveness. David acknowledged also this verse said, it's the flat and anything else. Jesus, in fact, I'm going to back up to verse 24, and I'll read on down. He's discussed going to hope. I don't have time to buy the nation of Israel. It was trodden down of the Gentiles in 1967. Means in the, uh, there shall be signs on the moon and the stars. What are they? 
these are things that deal with the atmosphere. Reverberate on the ocean floor and produces these large waves will get more and more frequently. I've been coming to Phoenix for 25 years. This is the coldest I've ever, ever seen Phoenix. What did you do to my Phoenix? There's some weird stuff been going on from when I was grew up. Surfeiting, anxiety, distractions. That's what that word marimna means. Distractions of this life. So that that day come pray always. Be accounted worthy to escape all those things which shall come before the Son of Man. You cannot trust the world system. But if you are free, and the world cannot touch you and collapse, but we can still keep going. In fact, when everybody else is in trouble, it'll be people like us they'll be looking to. Generator on the house. All the east side and lost all power for six days. Some of y'all remember that? Lost all power for six days. I was in Canada when it happened with Brother Hagin. I almost couldn't get back in the country. Hallelujah. On the world, you are glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and give God praise for the word tonight. Father, we thank you for the word. We give you praise and glory for the word. We honor you for the Thank you, Father. Praise God.